Hello and a warm welcome to Mark Langdon's Bets Club, your one-stop shop for football betting insight. We're coming off the back of an international break. So I'm hoping Mr Langdon is rested, rejuvenated, head of domestic football returning. Lots to get through this week. We'll be joined later on in the show by Dan Childs, his EFL take as well. Um, Mark, how's things? I'm all right, Jack. You can tell that I've, I've been very busy. I've not even had a shave um, for, for a few <laughs> days. I've been very hairy. But uh, yeah, apart from a... A travel nightmare, broken Britain um, on, on Monday, uh, tried and failed to get to Leeds. It's been a, um, a good international And you didn't, um, you didn't even get to your intended destination? Uh, no, no, not on the Monday. I had to um, try again um, on, on the Tuesday. Oh, no. um, and by the time I did get to Leeds, the sausage and egg McMuffin was well deserved. Um, <laughs> yeah, it has to be said. Our, our producer will mark constantly is telling us you know we're, we're now a, a video show we're on youtube so let's keep plugging it you calling yourself hairy is, is that a sell do you think we'll, we'll be inundated by women or is that a turn off well what the um the, i mean this is on the request of my wife she's demanding i, I grow a beard I, I don't think i i don't think i've got the patience for it i'm about what four or five days in um but okay. we'll we'll see how it goes I think I think it suits you, Mark. So if you are listening, head over to YouTube and you get to see Mark in his uh, in, in his new way. Uh, we have had an international break, um, Mark England. It was a, a successful one for. I mean, I, I guess the, the, the link into all of these is you know the game, the result. I just want to talk about Jude Bellingham because I, I mean I keep for, I keep forgetting how young he is. You know, he's just he's playing like kind of a twenty eight year old in the absolute prime of his career, and, and yet still so young remarkable remarkable talent we've got on our hands yeah absolutely uh, I think the fact that he kind of does it out of the public eye really in terms of sort of the UK viewers really um, you know you play for Real Madrid it it feels like it should be big but of course where it's only um, on La Liga TV in in Britain it makes it um, difficult really I think for most people to keep track of just how well he's doing you see the goals you, you read about it but um you know if he was playing for Manchester City for instance um you know you'd be reminded of it every three or four days wouldn't you um you know being able to watch it um as you say remarkable talent um you know I I, I do think that the comparisons would gather a, a good in, in, in and strong in one way because um you know the way that he kind of um just lit up a midfield is very much the way that Bellingham does and the way that he drives past um, players again is something that that, that Gaza um, did. But where Gaza was immature and probably still is, um, you know, Bellingham is the complete opposite. Absolute, like he was a leader for Borussia Dortmund. He is the leader for Real Madrid. The amount of late goals he's already scored yeah. this season kind of just took on that Zidane shirt as if it was nothing. And for England, you're right in saying that he does feel like he's 28. You feel like he's been there for a decade. The way, again, he's bossing people around. He's dominating the ball. Um, he he is just, um, he, I suppose Harry Kane's probably the first name on the team sheet, given he's the, the record goal scorer. But um, yeah, Bellingham can't be far behind him now. And he's made that number 10 position his own. And, you know, I, I think we now kind of know that England will go into the sort of Euros playing with, with Bellingham off Kane because um, anything else would be, I think, ridiculous from Southgate. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. It was a nice link there, Mark, because I wanted to to chat about Southgate. And I guess we, we've, you know, we're kind of going over trodden paths already with this discussion. Do, do you think he's capable of leading England on to, to winning a major a trophy? Yeah, I mean, I think if England win it, it won't necessarily be because of Southgate. Um you know, I, I I suppose if you look you at where if we he... lose it, it will be because of it, or not losing it, so to say. But if we say we, you know, we go. It depends where you go out. Uh, you know, I, you know, the Euros. I was disappointed with the way that he managed the final. Um, felt the subs could have come on earlier. You know, as the game got away from England, he didn't really have an idea on how to change it. Against France in the the World Cup, I don't think England did much wrong. Um, they did play aggressively. Um, you know, Kane missed a penalty. I thought they were the better team against France. So I think it depends. If England don't win, it would depend how they go out. Um, but uh, there's no doubt in my mind that England are the favourites to win um, the Euros. I, you just look at the the depth of talent um, in in that side, and 
you know, I, I don't see another team that comes that close to them, really. I mean, France is the obvious one, and, in, in, you know, France would be, um, I would say, the second best side um, going into it. Germany, under um, Julian Nagelsmann, now maybe they become more of a factor. Um, under Hansi Flick, it was going terribly wrong, but you know, I, I don't think there's a huge amount for England to fear. That's not sort of arrogance and sort of, you know, this kind of typical hyped up England. Just look at I mean, they've got about three or four right backs that would walk into most teams. Um, you know, Stones is world class centre back. I think Luke Shaw has come on a lot. I know he's injured at the moment. You've got Shaw and Chilwell at left back. You've got Rice and Bellingham as the as two in midfield, with probably one more to come in there. Um, you know, Saka, Foden, Grealish, Madison, Rashford um in sort of the wider positions. I might have even forgot of a couple. And then um you've got Kane up front. So I mean, you know, Pickford um, in goal is kind of, I suppose, been a question mark over him, but um, rarely let England down. And then there's the sort of Harry Maguire um, situation where I don't think he should be in the team. But again, he hasn't actually done that much wrong when he when he's worn the England shirt. So and, and international level, most teams have got a problematic position or, you know, maybe somebody that's not ideal um, in, in a position. So um, England and France, the, the the two standout teams, but I would say that of those, England, um, you know, are, are uh, the team to beat and they deserve to be favourites. You're exciting me, Mark. Um, yeah, great, great week for England. It was also a, a successful week for Scotland. They have qualified, so well done to them. And a, and a big win for Wales, Mark, as well. Um, yeah, did not it, see that coming, Jack. No, against not, Croatia. I mean, yeah, just a, a remarkable result for them. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, Wales were looking like it was going to have to be, you know, via the back door, um, you know, with, with, with the playoffs as their sort of best route in. Now they've given themselves a chance to go and um, do it automatically. Um, you know, we're missing some big players, Brennan Johnson, Aaron Ramsey, obviously all, you know, Bale had departed before that. The form was pretty terrible going into it. There was a lot of negativity from the crowd towards the manager, Rob Page, and then, They've gone and beaten, you know, a, a Croatia team that's that passed their best, um, but still one that, as we saw in the last World Cup and as we've seen, you know, in various tournaments in the last decade, are still in Nations League not that long ago. A difficult side to put away. So to beat them, um, what, what was a, a great result. And yeah, for Scotland, um, obviously beaten by France in that friendly, but the, the, the job was done before that. Uh, you look at their side and actually they've got a lot of players now that, apply their trade in the Premier League at a good standard. I suppose the, the, what happened there with the French game is that once you get a couple of players that, that are not playing, that squad depth is, mm. is maybe something to concern Steve Clark. But their best 11 should give a good account of themselves at the Euros. Absolutely. Uh, anything else to note from the international right? I did see a, a nasty injury for... For Neymar on on, on Brazil GC, I mean, he's getting to an age now that that could be sort of career-ending. ACL, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, gone to Saudi Arabia. So, um, in, in some respects, it all, almost career ending that move <laughs> in itself. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, a big blow for Neymar. The amount of injuries he has picked up, um, you know, I know there have been question marks over his lifestyle. And, you know, sometimes, you know, as that contributed to some of them, I mean, you can't say that for this ACL injury. There's, you know, Copper America. Um, coming up, um, you know, it's, it's a long way back for him. You're right. Yeah. I mean, hard to say that he's like, um, he hasn't fulfilled his potential when you look at all the trophies he's won. Uh, just maybe on that international stage, just, it's just so many injuries. Um, yeah. I've just like ruined what two World Cups for him. Um, and now he's got to pick himself up again. So, um, yeah, I, I suppose what one, just one last thing um, from Neymar to San Marino. San Marino. <laughs> Yes. scoring a goal um and there will have been many people that probably had Denmark to win to nil in the, in their Akers. so San Marino yeah. scoring their first competitive goal for a couple of years is going to be a big blow I would have thought to uh, a, a lot of the international football um Akka backers yeah I saw, saw one of our followers actually Mark. I think it was a it was a tenfold a lot of shorties in there but it was the Denmark game that that let them down with uh, with them not failing to keep a clean sheet so well done to to San Marino. Let's get on to Premier League action, Mark. It's good to have it back. We'll start with our big match. Chelsea against 
Arsenal, this one 5.30 on Saturday. Plenty of Saturday football, which is mightily exciting. Um, Chelsea, 21 to 10. The draw, 12 to 5. 13 to 10. Arsenal, Mark, I think if we would have previewed this game three or four weeks ago, I think it would have been a fairly routine conversation. Actually, now it feels quite evenly poised. Really looking forward to it. Obviously, we've chose this game over the Merseyside derby as our yeah. um, big match. Um, I think I think we're right um, to do so, Jack, because if you you know the, a local derby is big news to the people that support the teams. But I think if you sort of said, well, what's just the bigger game? Um, it is Chelsea against Arsenal, and for the reasons there that you mentioned, because Chelsea have started to pick up. I think as well, if you looked at Chelsea. They were actually on sort of expected goals. They were doing OK anyway. And, um, you know, they were just not getting the rub of the green, really. And that started to change. I suppose you could argue the fixtures have been nice, uh, nice enough for them. Most of the teams have gone to Burnley, haven't they? And, and sort of won. And, um, you know, that Fulham game, they, they had it wrapped up nice and early. But you've still got to, still got to win um, that match. Um, so, yeah, that they are starting to pick up and for Arsenal of course we haven't spoken since they um, beat Manchester City that was the last game before the international um, break you know that for some people was the sign that they're now ready to you know to go on and win a title that they've managed to down um, sort of you know the champions this is a hard game I I think at Stamford Bridge against um, Chelsea they've done well against Chelsea um, in, in recent times Arsenal but this might be sort of a tougher game than, than, than some of the more recent fixtures they've had in this uh, eagerly uh, contested London derby. I was I was going to say that that victory for Arsenal against Man City, almost, you know, just kind of getting rid of a, a bit of a mental block, seemingly, because it'd been so long since they'd beaten City. I mean, that could be huge for, for them going forwards. Yeah, I mean, I think on the mental block, that's fair enough, because what was it, 12 straight Premier League yeah. defeats? It's pretty ridiculous, really, to lose... 12 in a row to anybody when you're as good um, as Arsenal and, you know, the amount of sort of talented players they've had um, down the years um, that, that would have sort of partaken in that fixture. What I would say, though, is that I don't necessarily go along with the, oh, because you've beaten City, you know, that suddenly means something more than just the three points because, yeah. you know, the Martinelli shot hits the def- uh, Ake on the face and rebounds in. It could quite easily have hit Ake's face, rebounded wide, and Arsenal would have played exactly the same way, doing exactly the same things and got a different result. And that's the the kind of beauty and madness uh, of football. I, f- I was more disappointed if we sort of, sort of going over that game. I was disappointed with City. I thought they were really mm-hmm. negative in that last half an hour um, and handed the initiative to Arsenal. I think as the game wore on, Arsenal started to feel like there wasn't, you know, there wasn't that much to fear from City. Like, you know, uh, we can go on and win it. Declan Rice um, thought w- was fantastic in, in the midfield, really drove Arsenal forward, perhaps helped him that, you know, Jorginho was alongside him and kind of had one eye on the sort of defensive side of things. And Rice was able um, to sort of do what he likes to do, which is actually get involved further up, up the pitch. Martinelli made a difference um, when he came on. You know, they did it without Saka. I wasn't massively impressed with Jesus's decision making or Nketiah's overall um, play, but defended solidly enough. Maybe the goalkeeper uh, wobbly, but you know the actual defenders um, did well. Rice was excellent. You know it, it, it bodes well, but like I say, it would have it would have done the same thing if it would have finished nil nil. It's just you just get that extra fillip, don't you, of um, having beaten City and also um, taking a couple of points off them really in in, in what could be key come the end of the season. How do we how do we see Chelsea's trajectory from from here? Because it's been really tough to kind of work out where where they're at as a as a team and, and club at the moment. Yeah, I still still not entirely sure, you know, where they'll finish. Um, I just well, no, I'm pretty certain it will be sort of much better than what they they kind of currently are points per game. They've got a lot of injuries, or they've had a lot of injuries. Um, new manager, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons really why why the start has been slow um and we've also had the expected goals that i've already mentioned where they left a bit on the table when nkunku comes back um reese james you're going to see i think a better chelsea you know um chillwell and, and james have barely played together really in, in the last couple of years it's been a real blow for them that they've they've not been able to sort of 
get both of those players sort of fit and available. Raheem Sterling's playing very well. I suppose it's whether Nkunku um, can can score the goals that have been left on the table. You know, Nicholas Jackson um, has sort of not performed as well as what they expected. Goal stats would have suggested, bro, you got the goal against Fulham, but is he at the sort of required standard for a team that wants to, at the very least, be qualifying for the Champions League? So, I think I think Pochettino needs time. Um, they'll they'll just organically get better. I don't think you can spend the money that they've spent and just not be better than they are. Um, so it's not going to take much for them to sort of start climbing the table. If you were to ask me where they would finish this season, I think the slow start might cost them a Champions League spot. Okay, okay. Um, with all of that being said, Mark, what's the what's the selection for this game? I'm going to go for under two and a half goals. Um, if you look at Arsenal, um, you know, three clean sheets in their, um, you know, four Premier League games, sort of looking, uh, sort of being much more defensive minded, uh, really. And we, we've seen that um, with with the way that they played against City. I think even though the games against Tottenham and, Ars- uh, and Manchester United were higher scoring, if you actually looked at the way that Arsenal played, I don't think they were as aggressive as they were last year I think that it is something that Arteta's working on for them to be I suppose more responsible in 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 the defensive side of the work and this is a difficult away game four of the last five um, Chelsea Premier League games have been under two and a half goals as well I've spoken about the fact that they're not really finishing off their chances so um this this might be a slightly cagey um London derby yeah, looking forward to it. Nonetheless, uh, plenty more Premier League games to get through. We'll start with the Merseyside derby. Yeah, it's Liverpool against Everton. Saturday, 12.30. Uh, Liverpool, heavy favourites, 3-10. to 10. The draw, 5-1, to 15-2 if you fancy Everton. Mark, I mean, on paper and, and, and the way that the book is a price, it's very one-sided. Can you see it going any differently? Well... I, I, I mean, Everton. Have, Everton's attacking um, expected goals is absolutely wild because it's according to FB Ref, it's like fourteen point seven, which puts them at a very high level around kind of Manchester City. Um, wow. So that is um, that's interesting. I think they've had a very easy um, sort of set of fixtures, which has contributed to that. They've often been chasing games, um, mm. which again contributes to to that. So maybe don't take that as um, you know, a, a kind of a sign of where Everton are. I think this is a, a difficult game for Everton more than one way. Um, psychologically spoken about maybe how Arsenal got a, a big boost there. Everton, when they go to Anfield, and I know they ended the hoodoo a couple of years ago, but generally speaking, when they go to Anfield, they, they, they feel like they're beaten a lot of the time mm-hmm. before they've even stepped off the bus. Um, and so I'm going to go for Liverpool to win and over two and a half goals. That does play into the part that maybe you know Everton are slightly more attacking than um, we've seen in or expected under a Sean Dyche side. Uh, Liverpool, seven of their eight Premier League games have gone over two and a half. I think Jurgen Klopp is building a very attack-minded team with the intention of blowing away kind of the bottom half sides, and you know Everton, um, I, I think, are a, a bottom half team. Okay, uh, let's take a look at Brentford against Burnley. Mark um, Brentford favourites three to four. Draw fourteen to five, ten to three. Burnley, how have how have you kind of how have you have you been happy with the way that Burnley have adapted to to the Premier League? Because I think you you'll always get one of these sides, aren't you, coming up from the Championship who've played free flowing football. We've seen it with Norwich before. We've seen it with Leeds. It happens every season. And then how they adapt to the Premier League is it, it has differing results. What have you made of Burnley? Yeah. I mean, I was quite critical of them early on in the season when I was looking at their sort of team sheet. I was sort of wondering who some of the players were. Um, you know, it, it felt quite a different side, really, to the one that came up. They had a few loan players, didn't they? That um, that that had kind of you think someone like Teller, for instance, that um, had, had been influential. And um, and I was critical. Then, if you actually assess the fixture list. They've lost to Tottenham, Man City, Aston Villa, Newcastle, Man United and Chelsea. I mm. mean, in in a normal season, they're going to lose like most of those games. It just so happens that they've all been thrown in together. The two games that you would have said were against teams more at their level, they drew at Nottingham Forest and they beat Luton. So mm. um, I, I think Vincent Kompany 
will be drumming that into the squad that you know although you, the kind of league table says they're struggling been a hard start and this is much more a game at the type of level that they should uh, they should feel sort of more comfortable competing at and I'm going to go for Burnley or draw a double chance in this game Brentford Rico Henry Ivan Tony massively influential players have caught the you know, dropped the ball big time at Old Trafford um so I was gonna say last week it was a couple of weeks ago wasn't it but last time out were those two late goals they conceded mm-hmm. I'm not sure about how the goalkeepers. If the Flecken and uh, Stracos have, have, have played in goal for them this season, and I don't think either has played as well as what David Raya um, has done. So to lose Raya, Rico Henry, and Ivan Tony from that sort of successful side, you know, that, that, that they're big holes to fill, and I'm not sure they've done that um, quite so perfectly um, as, as, as they would have liked at the moment. OK, uh, let's take a look at Bournemouth against Wolves. 11 to 8 Bournemouth, 12 to 5 for the draw, 2 to 1 Wolves. Mark, which way do you see this one going? I'm going to go in the Gary O'Neill derby. I'm going to go for a, <laughs> yeah. um, a, a draw. Uh, obviously, Bournemouth you know, sacked um, Gary O'Neill. It was criticised at the time. Iriola had um, you know, a, a body of work in Spanish football that suggested Bournemouth were going to be very exciting. I think they've had a hard run of games um, at home. They lost to Tottenham, um, they lost to Arsenal, but they did do OK in draws at home to West Ham and Chelsea. So it's not like all is lost um, for them. It's This is an important time because they were you know, blitzed by Everton, weren't they, as well, um, before the international break. So I think Iriola sort of needs to get something on the board. And this is an opportunity. Wolves picked up well in recent times, four points from the Man City game and Aston Villa. I watched their game at Luton uh, recently away from home. I wasn't impressed even when it was 11 v 11. So, um, you know, I'd be hard pressed to want to back them to win at a relatively short price, but I'm not sure Bournemouth are in the mood to win this one either. OK, let's take a look at Manchester City against Brighton. 4 to 11 City, 9 to 2 the draw, 6 to 1 Brighton. I, I must say, I think I mentioned this on the last podcast we, we filmed together. I haven't been overly impressed with Brighton this season, really. I thought I mean, he was going to say Man City. I was no, like no, nodding, no, no, thinking no. Well, he was going to say Man City. To be fair with City against us, you, you mentioned earlier, I thought they were really kind of off the ball, they were quite lethargic at, at, at points. I mean, obviously it's Manchester City, they will hit the ground running at, at some stage. But no, Brighton, I think I, I, I want to see more from. Maybe expectations are just so high now. Yeah, I sort of know. I, I, I can get that vibe that, you know, because you're now rating them as yeah. a kind of team that, you know, could be top six, you know, maybe pushing for Champions League. That in itself is quite um, it's quite a, an accolade, isn't it, for, for, for Brian, Absolutely. that you're now judging them at that kind of level. Um, and it is difficult, I think, when those expectations are there to perform at that standard every single week. Um, they've got the Europa League, which is obviously going to complicate matters. They've had some injuries, lost Caicedo late on in, in the transfer window. But, you know, be, before the international break, they got that 2-2 draw against Liverpool. That was a blow because our treble um, had, had the sort of Liverpool um, sort of to, 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 to land that. It was so, a weird game, um, wasn't it? It, it was a weird game, yeah. I mean, I think I, I, I do I, I do know what you mean, but I'm sort of not, I'm not, I wasn't getting too giddy about Brighton before a ball was kicked. I still think if they can finish a roundabout Europa League, that's that's still a great season yeah. for somebody with Brighton's wage bill. And so therefore I think they've made a, a, a sort of satisfactory start to the season for sure. Um, in terms of this game, I'm going to go over three and a half um, goals. All Brighton's league and Europa uh, league games so far this season have been over three and a half. I think they'll attack Man City and that might sort of spark City into life um, somewhat because um, you know, nearly every game's the same for City now, where teams just defend deep and and look to frustrate them. Um, this is an occasion where they, they there might be some space, um, you know, for, for them to exploit. I think it's a dangerous game. I definitely wouldn't be putting Man City in the Ackers because I think Brighton have got that potential, but um, prefer the the, the, the goals bet because that gives you a couple of ways um, to win. Okay, uh, Newcastle Palace, Mark, um, one to two. Newcastle ten to three. The draw six to one. Palace, Newcastle going well. They are, yeah. Um, obviously got the Tonali um, 
sort of issue um, yeah. hanging over them now. Where what's the latest um, with, with with him? Well, I mean, you know, the, the reports in Italy this week said that um, he's been betting on games um, involving AC Milan when he was actually at Milan, which um, you know is it, frowned upon um, even more so in Italy than it would be in the UK. Um, he can expect, he can definitely expect a ban. I think it's just how long the ban so will it, be. So despite um, the, the the this happening in Italy, the ban can still come into effect. Yeah, the they, 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 um, the kind of Italian authorities will expect it to be respected, um, sure. throughout. Um, it's illegal for, um, footballers, um, to bet on football, um, in, in Italy. Um, it was also been reported that it was with, um, sort of on the black market as well. So he wasn't sort of walking into his, his local betting shop and filling out a coupon. Um, it, it, it was on the black market, which is um, another issue that he's got. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think um, that that's going to be a problem for Newcastle. But on the plus side, I think Botman expected to be back. Um, you know, a couple of other injuries have had time to clear up. Isak um, didn't go on international duty or withdrew, um, but he's expected to be OK. I'm going to go for Newcastle to win and under three and a half goals. Palace have got a lot of injuries at the moment. Eze, the, the obvious sort of big one, um, really. And then yeah, as far as Newcastle are, are concerned, that sort of 8-0 um, against Sheffield United, kind of the exception to the uh, rule there, kind of, you know, they were they're grinding it out um, at home to Brentford and against Burnley. And you know a Roy Hodgson team's going to defend, be compact and difficult to beat. So Newcastle to win and under three and a half goals. OK, good stuff. Uh, Forest against Luton, 4-6 to six, Forest, 11-4 to four for the draw, 9-2 to two, Luton. I, I think if you're a Luton fan, Mark, these are the types of games you're travelling to, just hoping for, for, for a point or something to just give you some degree of hope. Well, I mean, they won at Everton recently, so... Um, that's yeah, what I mean, um, in terms of building on, on that. These yeah, yeah, right, because they, they, they've lost a couple of home games, haven't they, since then. Um, so... I think I think the pressure here though is more on Nottingham Forest. I mean, how many games are Nottingham Forest going to in the Premier League expecting to win? Yeah. Um, there aren't there aren't many. Maybe Sheffield United at home when they did win, albeit um, with, with a late goal. I'm going to go um, for the, the, the bit of evens around for both teams to score. I, I, I sort of taking on board what you were saying here. This feels like a game where both teams will believe that they can get. You know, Forest will believe they should be winning, and Luton, Luton won't have too many better opportunities away from home to pick up points. So I think it will be quite um, an attack-minded um, game. And Luton, if you look at their record against sort of the non-big six teams, they have scored in five of those six matches. So it's not that, that there is a lack of sort of obvious quality there, but they are getting men forward and that they're putting balls into the box and that just causes problems. Mm. Uh, the late game on Saturday, Sheffield United against Manchester United, eight o'clock on on Saturday, um, let's take a look at the at the prices for this one. Six to one, Sheffield United. Four to one for the draw. Two to five, Manchester United. I feel like I keep asking this question, Mark, but I'm going to continue to ask it. The, the, the mood around Manchester United at the moment is it salvageable under the current kind of? Well, I guess we we know the situation, the ownership model, yeah. but the manager as well. Uh well, it's certainly more savable than it was after 88 minutes against Brentford um, a couple of weeks ago when, I mean, can you imagine how bad that international break would have been for Ten Hag if they'd lost at home yeah. to Brentford? It would have been brutal for him. I, I think the ownership issue is is complicated. Like, you know, you're getting somebody now um, potentially coming in, but not owning the whole club, but in charge of football matters. Um it's hard to know how that relationship will work. Um, I, it, it doesn't fill me with great confidence, I think, if I was a sort of Manchester United fan, that things are suddenly going to improve off the pitch. Mm. Um, in terms of on the pitch, if you were to give Ten Hag the benefit of the doubt, you would say, I mean, at least judging when the players are fit. I mean, there have been so many injuries um, at United um, this season. Martinez, Varane, Shaw, that's three of the back four, isn't it? Um, you know, in midfield, Mount hasn't really been able to get going. Um, but then you could say, well, when he has played, he hasn't been amazing. Um, Anana, big money signing, as as well, he's been less than amazing. He's been at fault for um, a number of goals already. 
I think the, the one bright spark and hope for me is that they spent a lot of money on Hoyland, but he looks a threat to me. He's yeah. definitely added something up front that, that United didn't have. Um, and when you've got somebody with that kind of potential, I think there's always hope that, you know, better things are, are to come. And this this should be a very winnable game for Manchester United. I'm going to go for United to win an under three and a half goals. A bit like what I said with Newcastle. That ain't nil, though, for Sheffield United. It was real deep outlier, really, on, the, on their other sort of defeats, if you like. They were beaten 2-1 against City and Tottenham, 2 nil at West Ham. So, you know, that, that ain't nil. I'm not sure where it came from, um, but not expecting it to be as easy for Manchester United, but for them still to get the job done comfortably enough. OK, uh, just the one game on the Sunday this week. It's Aston Villa against West Ham, 10 to 11, the home side, 13 to 5 for the draw, 14 to 5 if you're backing West Ham. And I guess two clubs here, Mark, will be relatively pleased with their with their start. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I mean, Aston Villa being sort of all or nothing, really, for them, there's been some yeah. bad results and some very good ones. Um, West Ham, I think, had a hard run of games. You look at the games that they've lost only to Liverpool and to, to Man City. So, um, you know, that David Moyes can be definitely pleased with results. I know not all West Ham fans are delighted with the performances. Um, if you look at, like, possession stats, they're one from bottom. And then if, like, sort of in terms of, like, passing, they're, like, bottom three for, for short passes and medium passes and completed passes and all of those kind of, I suppose, what tends to make a team feel more attractive. Yeah. Um and so, the stylistically, maybe West Ham are not um, are, are not doing anything special, but the results are clear and obvious, for, you know, for all to see. And they're, they're, they're doing well in uh, the Europa League again. This game I found very tricky. I'm just mm. not. I'm not so sure it's going to be a sort of goal field as what the, the the bookmakers think. And so, I was looking at a couple of ways to to kind of oppose that angle. And the best I can find is. There's a bit of six to four around for no in the both teams to score market. So at least one team not to score. Now, both teams have scored in seven of West Ham's eight games this season. But if you look at the sort of shot stats, they've not been wild games. Um, mm. They only had a um, handful of shots against Newcastle in that 2-2. Two -two. So I think at some stage that West Ham goal trend is going to kind of reverse itself um, and, and get more in line with their sort of statistics and it might come against Aston Villa. I think from, from Villa's point of view, have they got that kind of the guile to open up a, a kind of solid West Ham side. And then if they do get in the lead have West Ham got that creativity to come back. So um, I'm, I'm, you know, hoping cheering on a, a nil nil because um, that, that, that'd be perfect. But even if one team does get in front, I'm not sure the other one um, has got that sort of creativity to get back into the game. Lots of um, lots of goals angles this week, Mark. Is that, is, yeah, we'll see if that continues Tricky in the coupon. next game. Tricky coupon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've 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 put you off for half an hour here, Mark, talking about your beloved Spurs. So I'll give you a few minutes in in the line right here. I mean, just uh, in terms of everything you could have wished for this season, you probably most of those dreams have been ticked off, haven't they? Oh yeah, yeah, for, for sure. Um, you know, to head into the international break, top of the Premier League. Don't think yeah. anyone, um, you know, realistically would would have expected that. Um, particularly after selling Kane, um, and, and not really uh, replacing him, and all the kind of talk pre-season was that it would take a while for uh, sort of the um, Postecoglou um, effect really to sort of be be seen in the pitch, and that when he'd gone elsewhere, it had taken time, and you know, results had slow and that first half at Brentford was far from amazing and you know mm. I think there was trepidation even the first half against Manchester United could easily have gone into that one behind um, but they didn't they've come out of it obviously got the, the dramatic winners against Liverpool and Sheffield United and then showed a different side to themselves at um, Luton last time out when you know dominated the game could have been yeah. two or three up um, before Bissouma was sent off and then Second half, um, you know, with 10 men to go on and win the game, even against Luton, it's not an easy um, job that. And, and they defended really well, um, you know, and, and and it just helps just build that bond, I think, between manager, um, players and, and supporters. And um, did you see the, um, I think Sam Matterface in 
on Talksport said that he walked past the dressing room um, and Ireland's in the stream um, was was uh, blaring out of the away dressing room at Kenilworth Road, and that's sort of now um, trying to become the vibe anthem from the supporters back to the team. So um, you might even you might even get a, a version of it um, in the game against Fulham. How do you see this kind of? Um, what what way are you playing from a betting perspective? Um, yeah, going to sort of completely change tack now and go for Fulham plus one on the Asian handicap. So you get your money back if Tottenham win by one goal. I've mentioned some of those dramatic late wins. So, you know, when they play against a low block, Tottenham haven't always found it easy to, to open up teams, even with uh, James Madison um, in good form. And I think that this will be um, a struggle uh, for Spurs without Bissouma. Big loss to them um, in the midfield. Don't forget, Fulham did draw um, against Arsenal already this season. So they're, they're, they've got a bit of form in the book against a sort of, you know, a big six side in North London. So um, not going to be easy for Tottenham. They had a few injuries over the international break. Romero, Son um, and Saar. I think they're all going to play, but maybe not at absolute 100% at the moment. So, um, it, yeah. yeah, a tricky game, I think. It does feel like going into every game at the moment, Son is kind of on the, you know, li- leaving it late because there's always, it seems to be kind of just niggles. Sort yeah, of I, I was um, I was straight on um, to um, my my man in um, in in Korea um, sort of on on yesterday morning to find out the latest on Son. He insists he's OK. Um, so, OK. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, that, I've, I've had the word. We, we've got a. You got, you got to remember, we've got a, we've got a business in South Korea, so I've, I've got many. Uh, I've, I've, I've got ins in South Korea, and I'm, I'm hearing Sonny's okay. <laughs> South Korean correspondence on Vets Club, absolutely brilliant. Right, I think that's the Premier League rounded off. Uh, time to catch up with Dan Charles to discuss all things EFL. If you want some free football bets this season, we've got you covered. Simply head to RacingPost.com forward slash free bets, and there you'll find over two hundred pounds worth of them. For you to use this season that's racingpost.com forward slash free bets always a pleasure to be joined by dan child's um efl action returning of course there were some games going on during the international break um dan how, how are you yeah I'm, I'm good jack yeah i'm glad to have a, a full complement of games back uh you know it's quite quite a sparse uh selection last week Absolutely. Now we'll, we'll start with your team in focus, and and this week's side, Dan. I feel when when we're kind of approaching the season and, and we're talking about anti post selections, the team you're about to mention are always in consideration um, for promotion. Um, talk us through uh, what what you've got your eye on at the moment. Yep, yeah, uh, Mansfield up in, uh, down down in League Two. I mean, they're one of only two unbeaten teams in the EFL at the moment. Um, which I mean, not a surprise that there's only two because we're quite away into the season. But Portsmouth are unbeaten in League One, Mansfield unbeaten in League Two. Uh, watched their game uh, against Notts County was 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 on was on Sky last weekend. Big derby match between two promotion t- chasing teams. Uh, Mansfield, you know, went behind in in about two or three minutes and come back to. To win 4-1, I mean, they were absolutely superb on the day. Uh, I've been following them through the season. I've noticed they've drawn a lot of games, but a lot of them games, they looked like they were dominating, including the game against Wrexham. They drew 0-0, dominated that game. Wrexham were really fancy, you know, in the markets to go well this season. Uh, so I've, I've kind of been keeping my eye on them. And to do what they did at Notts County, uh, not wasn't just the victory, it was the manner of it. Uh, Luke Williams, a Notts County manager, who's very, very honest after every every post-match interview after the game. He's, you know, he's asked, you know, what went wrong there? And he said, it was nothing to do really with my side. We've just played against by far the best team we've mm-hmm. come up against in the division. So, uh, you know, he, he, you take it from Luke Williams there uh, that Mansfield are, they're a serious force to be reckoned with. One to keep an eye on. Um, sure, and, and I, one thing I would add there with Mansfield as well is, They've actually they're doing this without some key players. I mean they've they've got three long term injured players at the moment: Alfie Kilgore, Stephen Quinn, and Reese Oates, who are all, all big players for them. They were starting at the start of the season. Have all got long term injuries. So the fact that they're they're doing it without three key players says you know even more about them. And the, you know each of those players at some stage will be back to strengthen them even more. Absolutely, mightily impressive. Mansfield, keep them on the radar. Down three selections. For you this week, across the divisions of the EFL, we'll start in the championship. And I don't think I'm going to like what I'm about to hear. 
Not going to like this one, Jack. No, it's uh, going to go with Leeds uh, away to Norwich. I mean, in the in the table, there's actually only two points between these sides, uh, but, which kind of seems a bit strange because the mood of the two sets of fans is very, very different at the moment. You kind of feel that Leeds are going one way, going you know, you know climbing up the table, and Norwich seems to be going in the opposite direction. I think the reasons for this for Norwich, I mean, you'd know, you know, as as, as much probably more than me, but I, I just feel that. Both penalty boxes. You look at the, you know, they've lost Timu Puki at the end of last season. Got Ashley Barnes in as a replacement. He's now out long term. You've got Josh Sargent, who's another big, big player in, in the Norwich attack. He's 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 out as well with that sort of freak injury he picked up at, at Huddersfield. And in the centre at defence, I just feel there's a lack of sort of leadership and personality. And I think that's where sort of Grant Hanley in the past has come in. He's out long term as well. So. I just feel, you know, spine of a side is always very, very, very important. And that may be a bit of an issue at the moment for, for Norwich. Leeds are sort of going the other way. They did a lot of their business late in the window. So it's understandable they had a bit of a shaky start. But they're they're really getting going now under, as, as, you, as you well know, Jack, a former Norwich manager in Daniel Farker. They're, they're playing in his typical sort of attacking style of play. They're really, you know, you look at their numbers in matches, they're, they're registering a lot of shots, having a lot of possession and territory and domination. And the results are starting to come. They've won three of the last four games and odds against, you know, to win here. Norwich have got a good home record, but I would still fancy Leeds to win this one. I was surprised to see Leeds odds against Dan, just because of, of, of everything you, you've mentioned there. I, I guess, is it the home form that's kind of pushing out Leeds' price I think somewhat? so, yeah. I mean, Norwich have won, you know, four of their five home matches. And the, mm. the exception, obviously, was against Leicester, who are absolutely, you know, you know, flying at the moment. So you can kind of understand just based on that, you know, why there's odds against for Leeds. But just looking, as I said, about in the last few weeks, the trajectory of the two teams, I just feel that that price is, uh, is too good to miss. Daniel Farkas, Leeds United first on the list for Dan Childs. Who's up next? Uh, we'll, we'll go. We'll drop into League Two first. Uh, go to Swindon, I fancy, away to Salford. Swindon in sixth place at the moment. Salford fifteenth. Swindon. Both teams would have been expected to, to be in like the promotion wreck. And I mean, it's still time for Salford to get up there, but they've been affected by a lot of injuries in the last sort of couple of months. Uh, that's been impacted on their results. They've lost six of their last nine league games. They. they, they, they uh, they're kind of the injuries are really, especially in forward areas. They're, they're lacking a, a lot of you know options there. Connor McLennan, uh, Callum Hendry, Connor McElhaney, That's three three attacking players that have been out injured. A lot of reliance on Matt Smith, the big centre forward who is doing well. He's got nine goals at the moment, but you kind of feel with you know their opposition. If you can cope with Matt Smith, you can cope with Salford and. Swindon, they've not got that issue. They, they've got loads of attacking options. Dan Kemp's got eight goals this season. Jake Young, who's on loan from Bradford, has got nine. Charlie Austin's only got three so far, but you would think that he's going to you know, hit form at some stage as well. So you look at that firepower Swindon have got, and I mean, the price, they're six to four to go there and win at Salford, who have not got a great home record. I think that's a, a really good bet. OK, uh, third and final pick for you, Dan. Third and final, we'll drop into to, to League One. Um, Port Vale, I fancy, to, to get you know at least some kind of result, a draw or a win away to Stevenage. I mean, these are two teams that sort of started well. They were sort of surprise, sort of early front runners in the division. Both of them have kind of dropped off a bit recently. Port Vale, I mean, I, they have lost the last three games, but I, I like to sort of like react to you know game by game. And, and I looked at their, in their last match two weeks ago. They lost two 0 away to Portsmouth, but according to the reports, it was a very even game. Port Vale actually won the shot count there at Fratton Park, 14 to 13. So there's a signs there that, you know, maybe this, this you know, sticky patch of theirs won't last very long. And they're, they're taking on Stephen, I think, at the right time at the moment. Stephen has lost three of the last four matches under Steve Evans. were beaten 3-0 away at Blackpool last weekend. They've got a few sort of injuries and suspensions at the moment as well, Stephen. So I just think Port Vale... I don't think there'll be much to choose between the teams, but Port Vale, when you get the, the draw as well on, on side, I think is a, is a good bet. That's great, Dan. Th thanks as always. You're welcome, Jack. Right, Mark, time, time to collate some of your best bets um, for this weekend. Shall we start with a, with a bet builder? Yeah, I mean, we, I think it is a tricky um, old week, so um, playing it sort of a bit safer, maybe. Um, so we're going for Liverpool to beat Everton in the Merseyside derby. They've won all of their home games this season. All of them have featured at least three goals, so going to put in over two and a half goals. And I think Salah is the obvious place to look, um, yeah. you know, for, for, for your first goal scorer. Um, Betts really um, looks in decent nick. 
um, for sure against Brighton when he got a couple of goals. But mm. I, you know, he scored against um, West Ham as well. He scored against um, Villa. He scored against Bournemouth. So, you know, he's, um, he, he's doing well at Anfield as well. And when I was at the game um, when they played with nine men, at, at Spurs and even with 10 men I thought he was a real big threat and been question marks as to kind of his levels I think over the last year and whether he's still kind of you know as good as he once was I, I think he is so yeah the, um, it might be a, a, a difficult afternoon for, for Everton. I think because there has been you know other standout players in the Premier League you know we've kind of veered away from 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 digging up Salah but his form is just relentless isn't it because even when he doesn't score this season he's been notching kind of assists it's yeah he's yeah, fr- threat. frighteningly good big threat obviously Gakpo's been injured so um there's one less threat there um in terms of the, the, the Nunez did well on the international break but he's obviously been away in South America it's the the Jurgen Klopp absolutely hates it. It's the early kickoff. Um so how are the South Americans not you, you can't be sure can you about Luis Diaz um in, in in terms of that um um as well so um yeah i, I just felt salah was, was the obvious place yeah great stuff uh how about a multiple for this weekend yeah so um just veering off of a treble just because um it was coming in quite short so we're going to try and get um four timer together liverpool to beat everton newcastle to beat crystal palace who are um struggling with injuries at the moment i think manchester united much like how they beat Burnley in, in that recent away game, would we'll, we'll do a similar job at Bramall Lane. And then my boys in League Two, Stockport, yeah, um, well. they are rampant at the moment. And uh, yeah, no stopping them, hopefully, um, this week and they can get another uh, three points. So Liverpool, Newcastle, Man United and Stockport. Brilliant stuff. Um, what's your best bet for this weekend? I think it's Newcastle, Newcastle to win and under three and a half goals. Um, you know, Newcastle are a team that, I think, you know, if you take out that 8-0 against Sheffield United, I know the Newcastle fans won't want to um, forget that game, obviously. But, you know, if you look at the rest of their Premier League wins, um, you know, they, they they hammered Aston Villa, didn't they, early on? But I think against the team that's going... And Villa didn't defend the way that Crystal Palace are going to defend. You know, Palace in Gahey and Anderson have got two very solid centre-halves, decent goalkeeper behind them. So it's going to be difficult um, for Newcastle to to plot a way um, to, to goal. I expect their quality to eventually tell, but not in like a wide margin win. And Palace going to be difficult for them to add to the um, goal tally with, with Eze out. You know, he's so important to them from a creativity um, point of view. So, yeah, Newcastle to win an under three and a half goal. So, you know, it, it does give you many options on the Newcastle to win angle up to 3-0. But, you know, if Palace do score, you've also got the the 2-1 um, playing for you. And I think that sort of 2 ones more likely than, say, a 4 or 5-0. So, yeah, Newcastle and the under three and a half goals. Mark, excellent. And what does the rest of the week hold for you? Yeah, not much actually. Got no. a clear calendar. Um, I suspect you're Norwich got Jack. from your from your travel chaos of, of earlier. This yeah, week. that's it. Are you are you watching Norwich? Yeah, well, it's I'm feeling rather down about Norwich. We've got Leeds. Um, Daniel Farker returns. We're in horrible form. I mean, the script is kind of written, isn't it? Farker celebrating in front of his new fans. It's kind of like seeing a you know a girl you used to love now with someone else and having a much better time than you are. It's it's not very. It's not very nice. I have not experienced that, Jack. But obviously, <laughs> you have. Mark, thanks very much as always. A big thanks to Dan Childs as well for his insight on the EFL. Remember, there's been plenty of selections put up on this week's edition of Bets Club. Please don't feel the need to back them all. Only ever gamble with money that you can afford to lose. We will see you again next Thursday for another episode of Mark Langdon's Bets Club.